Coming up on The World Today. Iran successfully test launch a ballistic missile with a potential 2,000 kilometer range. Portuguese police begin third day of search for British three-year-old girl Madeleine McKinn. Plus, U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen maintains June the 1st as U.S. debt ceiling deadline. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Anne Wawado. Thank you for joining us. Let's begin in Iran, where the country has successfully test launched a ballistic missile with a potential 2,000 kilometer range, two days after the chief of Israel's armed forces raised the project of action against Tehran over its nuclear program. Iran, which was one of the biggest missile programs in the Middle East, says its weapons are capable of reaching the bases of ArcFo's Israel and the United States in the region. The state news agency, Iran IRNA, says the liquid fuel missile had been named the Kaaba, the reference to a Jewish castle overrun by Muslim warriors in the early days of Islam. Israel, which the Islamic Republic does not recognize, sees Iran as an ex existential threat. But Iran says that its ballistic missiles are an important deterrent and retaliatory force against the United States, Israel, and other potential regional adversaries. And U.S. forces held their largest ever live fire exercises involving thousands of troops and hundreds of military vehicles simulating a full-scale attack from North Korea. South Korea's defense ministry says the five-day exercise kicked off in Pochian near the border with the north and it was joined by some 2,500 troops from the south and the United States with multiple tanks, outsized and fighter jets all mobilized. U.S. and South Korean forces have been carrying out various types of military training including air and sea raids and drills involving American B-1B bombers in recent months after diplomatic efforts and a COVID-19 restrictions led many to drill being scaled back. However, North Korea has reacted furiously to those joint drills and its leader Kim Jong-un has said the planned launch of the first spy satellite was necessary to counter perceived threats from the US and South Korea. Portuguese police began a third day of search for the British three-year-old girl Madeleine McCann around Silves Reservoir in southern Portugal. Police tents were near Cessin near that reservoir, as about 50 kilometers from where the three-year-old disappeared in May 2007. She vanished from her bedroom in the apartment her family was staying at in, in Praia da Luz Resort in the coast near there. German prosecutors last year named Christian Buchan Bruckner as an official suspect in McCann's disappearance. The convicted child abuser and drug dealer is behind bars in Germany for raping a 72-year-old woman in the same area in that region where McCann went missing. However, he has denied any involvement in her disappearance. The McCann case remains a mystery as nobody has ever been found. Over in Australia, where firefighters contained a massive blaze that gutted a large seven-story building in central Sydney, forcing emergency services to evacuate people from nearby apartment buildings. According to New South Wales Fire and Rescue Acting Commissioner Jeremy Fretwell, over 30 fire trucks and 120 firefighters fought a huge fire at the abandoned former hat factory close to the Sydney Central Railway Station. Witnesses say they heard a loud crash and the ground shook when the walls of the building collapsed. And then a huge like flume of smoke came up. And then, like, that whole wall just caved in. And the biggest, like, loud crash. 
and then now it's just smoke, smoke, smoke. But it was the loudest noise, literally like the ground shook. Shortly after we arrived, the uh, front wall collapsed into the street. But uh, hopefully I think all the firefighters were standing back, so it's no big problem. But I think it's an empty building, so that's good. Fire and Rescue firefighters together with New South Wales Police had a, a very significant effort in the early stages to evacuate those surrounding buildings and get people out to safety. Um, I'm pleased to report that there's been no indications of any injuries to any of the um, members of the public. So we have over 30 fire trucks and 120 firefighters working on the scene. Uh, the state of play at the moment is the fire is effectively contained to the buildings that it was involved in. Um, there was some small level of fire spread to some of the surrounding apartment buildings. Uh, our firefighters have extinguished that. And a quick check on the weather now. Uprooted trees were seen on crushed cars today after Guam Super Typhoon Mawar, its most powerful storm in years. The Category 4 typhoon unleashed winds and torrential rain on the western Pacific island, according to the Guam Pass Authority. All but 1,000 of the island's 52,000 homes and businesses lost power, but the government officials have reported nothing unusual in hospital emergency rooms and only moderate damage such as flooding, fallen debris and downed power lines. After the storm passed, Goem's Office of Civil Defence issued a bulletin warning people that the highest stage of alert remained in effect and advised residents to stay indoors until the government declared it was safe. Hundreds of Texans gathered in over the end of the candlelight vigil to mark the anniversary of the school shooting that uh, took the lives of 19 children and two teachers. The Texas legislators probe of the shooting blamed systemic failures and poor leadership for contributing to the death toll. The bottom line, the report found, is that the law enforcement responders failed to adhere to their active shooter training and they failed to prioritize saving the lives of innocent victims over their own safety. The 77-page report said 376 law enforcement officers rushed to the school in the chaotic scene marked by a lack of clear leadership and sufficient urgency. Meanwhile, the U.S. President Joe Biden renewed his call for a ban on assault weapons as he and his wife, Jill Biden, held a White House event to mourn the lives lost in the Texas elementary school shooting one year ago. Mr. Biden renewed his appeal for Congress to ban AR-15 assault rifles and high-capacity ammunition magazines. And in each place, we hear the same message. Do something. For God's sake, please do something. We did something afterwards, but not nearly enough. We still need to ban, in my view, AR-15 firearms and assault weapons once again. You know, they've been used time and again in mass killings of innocent children and people. We need to ban high-capacity magazines, the ability to shoot 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 bullets without reloading. Because today, guns remain the number one killer. The number one killer of children in America, guns. And over the last year since Uvalde, our country has experienced a staggering 650 mass shootings. And well over, it's hard to say, well over 440,000 deaths due to gun violence. We can't end this epidemic until Congress passes some common sense gun safety laws that keep weapons of war off our streets and out of the hands of dangerous people. Until states do the same thing. How many more parents will live their worst nightmare before we stand up to the gun lobby? Establish universal background checks. Establish a national red flag laws. Require safe storage of firearms. And end immunity from liability for gun manufacturers. The only, the only major corporate entity that doesn't have this immune to liability. Even a majority of responsible gun owners support these common sense actions to save lives and keep our community safe. I know for a long time it's been hard to make progress. 
But there will come a point where our voices are so loud, our determination so clear that we can no longer be stopped. We will act. U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen has maintained early June as a debt ceiling default deadline. She says it will all date um, Congress shortly about government finances. Speaking at a Wall Street Journal forum, Yellen said it was heard to be precise about exactly which day the U.S. government will run short of funds, but added that she will try to increase the level of precision on the date based on incoming government receipts. Yellen also reiterated that she expects to be able to pay the U.S. government's bills until June the 1st without a debt limit increase, leaving just over a week for White House negotiators and congressional Republicans to reach a compromise and see the deal approved by Congress. It's highly likely that we would run out of resources to meet all the government's obligations in early June and possibly as early as June 1st. Um, so... Uh, we no longer see very much likelihood um, that our resources will enable us um, to get to the middle or end of June. Treasury and President Biden will face very tough choices if Congress doesn't act to raise the debt ceiling. And um, if, if we hit the so-called X date without that occurring, um, there will be some obligations um, that we will be unable to pay. I think the most important thing to recognize is that we must raise the debt ceiling. There isn't any outcome um, that is acceptable. Uh, we will default on some obligation, and um, that's really not an acceptable state of affairs. It threatens... Um, the strong recovery that we have in the U.S. economy, it threatens financial markets, and um, we simply have to raise the debt ceiling. Meanwhile, U.S. House Democratic leader Hakeem Jeffries has called on House Republicans to break with the extreme wing of their party and work with Democrats to avoid a default. Negotiators for Democratic President Joe Biden and top congressional Republican Kevin McCarthy held what both sides called productive talks to try to reach a deal to raise the United States' $31.4 trillion debt, dollar debt ceiling and avoid a catastrophic default. Well, the stakes are now crystal clear. House Democrats have provided a vehicle to end this reckless and dangerous default crisis and avoid the economy crashing. Moderate Republicans have said they want to avoid a dangerous default. Find common ground with Democrats and avoid a job-killing recession. It's now time for House Republicans to break with the extreme wing of their party and join House Democrats to put an end to the default crisis. The failure of five House Republicans to do so will simply reinforce the point that at the end of the day, what they really want is for America to default. House Republicans have the opportunity to prove that that is not the case. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis has officially joined the race for the U.S. presidency. He released his first campaign video setting up a direct confrontation in the Republican contest with his one-time ally, former U.S. President Donald Trump. The ad was released when an audio inter interviewer on Twitter meant to showcase his entry into the race, instead drew attention for technical problems. DeSantis made his announcement in a video ahead of joining Twitter CEO Elon Musk on the platform. 
The broadcast of the interview, which had been intended to be the formal launch of the Desantis campaign, at times lost sound, and then some users were either unable to join or they were dropped. It was an in your speaker's start for the campaign, predicated on the governor's executive competence. The Florida governor's entrance in the Republican contest set up a showdown with his one-time ally, former President Donald Trump, that will shake up the race for the White House. Uh, let's join our Washington correspondent, Maria Bird. She joins me now for more. Hello, Maria, and it's good to see you. Good to see you as well. So let's talk about Ron DeSantis' long-awaited entry into the 2024 race for the White House. It was hit by technical glitches after a Twitter live stream malfunctioned. How are people reacting to this? Well, I think people are not surprised. Um, they're touting the fact that he broke the internet uh, with this announcement. I think that this was a very unconventional way to announce and to launch um, your bid for um, a specific party um, for the presidential election. And so I think they're um, not surprised about the way in which he did something different. But I also think they were expecting, and I think this was uh, something that people have been waiting on. Just if you look at all that he's been doing in Florida, kind of um, his stance, even if you look at the back and forth between Disney and the state of Florida, uh, he has been right and he has been basically showing us that he was going to run uh, for president. So I think it's an expected uh, launch of the campaign. Um, and now I think people are just waiting to see how this will impact uh, the Republican Party now that we have several uh, very viable candidates in the race. Now, this announcement has officially put him as former President Donald Trump's rival. What do you make of this, being that he was once an ally of President Trump? Yes, they, took, they are competing for the same base. Um, and so, obviously, as you said, he was a supporter of the former president. And so this is now um, getting to a place where you're seeing where they're showing the small differences between the two. But those who are uh, what people have called the MAGA Republican Party uh, would definitely uh, align with uh, Governor DeSantis's viewpoints and potentially uh, being aligned with him for the campaign. And so he is likely the strongest opponent in competition for the former president. And the real question is going to be what uh, those uh, far right Republicans will see as where they want to lead the party toward. Or this could end up being a fractioning piece where you see the far right is not able to have the kind of support uh, from the entire Republican Party. And we could see potentially another uh, candidate end up getting the Republican bid for uh, presidency. But so we're about to see a dramatic face off between those two. I think we're going to be watching fireworks over the summer. Uh, this is going to be a very interesting summer period, um, as uh, many have put their bid in. But I think especially between Governor DeSantis and the former president, you will probably hear more from former President Trump than we have been hearing, just to keep himself viable in the race and to keep his face at the forefront of what he believes uh, should be uh, his ticket to the White House. Now, knowing all the drama around President Donald Trump, former President Trump right now, do you think that he will be intimidated by a fellow Republican because already he has uh, U.S. President Joe Biden to contest with in the first place? Yes, I, you know, and that will be the question I think we'll begin to see it over the next 30 days, whether or not the campaign uh, will begin to focus in on some of the legal challenges that the former president is facing right now and whether or not they will use that as a leverage point for their campaign. Uh, but that could potentially um, hurt the former president, just really depending on how Governor DeSantis decides to use it. But it's highly likely that the former president will then bring forth any legal matters uh, that Governor DeSantis is facing, and that will begin to uh, continue with uh, the competition that we will likely see in the coming months. All right, so away from the competition, Maria, it seems uh, U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen is already signing the debt ceiling deadline into the government years. She's singing it already. June 1st is just a few days away, as she's maintained. She says the day is sacrosanct. What should we expect? Well, what potentially could happen, what we've seen before, is that they could extend the debt ceiling through December the 31st, which is the end of the calendar year. 
Um, we've seen that before where they will say we're giving you a six months uh, until the Democrats and Republicans can come up with a viable solution um, to uh, increasing the debt ceiling for the long term. So that is potentially what we could see. It's, it's highly unlikely that we will actually see us go into default. Uh, but again, there are some Democrats and Republicans that are saying that instead of signing this bill and voting for this bill, that they would rather see default happen. Um, I don't think the president is going to uh, not sign a bill, no matter how it comes forward to the White House, even if it shows some areas that he believes uh, should not be. I know that he has talked about increasing taxes should not be included in this bill. So even if that is included, I don't see him not signing the bill. Um, but the real question is going to be whether or not the Democrats that are highly opposed to some of the ask of the Republican Party and those Republicans that are highly opposed to some of the ask uh, from the Democratic Party will come to the middle um, and vote for this or we'll see a temporary stay through December 31st. But what's the worst that could happen if, I mean, when the government runs out of cash to pay its bills? The worst that could happen is that the government will have to decide what bills are going to be paid. And obviously, if for those um, who are not able to pay our bills toward, will we be able to continue uh, positive trade relationships? And I think that's where you're potentially looking at harming the U.S. economy and the American people. Because if we begin to have an issue around trade um, and our buying power, we then could see the cost of items that today have been uh, pushed down um, due to some of the um, impacts of the uh, reduction of inflation, we could begin to see inflation occur again. All right. Thank you very much. Our Washington correspondent, Maria Barrett, for your contribution on the world today. Welcome back. Countries from around the world gathered at the United Nations to pledge $2.4 billion in humanitarian assistance for the Horn of Africa. The meeting called to address the threats faced by 43 million people in Ethiopia, Kenya and Somalia saw representatives from countries like Germany, Sweden and Canada offering to increase donations from their original goals. According to the United Nations, crises brought on by the drought, displacement and food insecurity require at least $7 billion for the Horn of Africa region. However, Italy, Qatar, the United Kingdom and the United States summoned international representatives for the pledging event in collaboration with three affected countries. Crisis atop top of crisis is threatening the lives and livelihoods of millions across the Horn of Africa. The longest drought on record. Mass displacement after years of conflict and insecurity. Skyrocketing food prices. And now chaos and fighting have engulfed Sudan, radiating instability across the entire region. I call on donors and the international community to urgently fund the 2023 humanitarian response plan for the region. Today, they are just close to 20% funded, and this is unacceptable. China's embassy in Kenya has denied that Chinese hackers attacked key state agencies in the capital Nairobi, including the presidency. This was reportedly done to assess whether the East African nation will service billions of dollars owed to Beijing. The years-long cyber attack started back in 2019 when the Chinese started closing credit taps to Kenya as debt strains started showing. According to a statement, the Chinese embassy said the report was far-fetched, adding that hacking is a common threat to all countries and China is also a victim of cyber attack. The embassy says it is a highly sensitive political issue to blame a certain government for a cyber attack without solid evidence. But Kenya has reportedly cut borrowing from China and as of March, it owed the southeastern Asian country $6.31 billion. Let's speak with Kenyan journalist Cyrus Sombati, who joins me now for more on this. Hello, Cyrus. Thank you for joining us. Hello. Thank what you, you so much for having me on the Yeah, what do you make of this denial by China? Oh, well, even now, uh, even, uh, thank you so much for having me on this session today. Even now, right now, as we're speaking, the Kenyan government has issued a statement also denying the same allegations. But uh, we find it queer in a way because... Uh, 
Kenya and uh, China currently they are in a way bad relationship. The, the relationship they had since 2019 as compared to now, to 2019 and to 2022, uh, the relationship is bad. It's, it's, it's actually poor, you can say, as you can put it. Has there been any immediate comments or reaction from the Kenyan government? Uh, well, uh, the, the, the principal secretary for Kenya's internal security has issued a statement right now uh, denying the allegations that uh, China actually hacked uh, Kenya's uh, major state department. The statement issued by Mr. Raymond Omolo says that uh, the, the claims are perfect in a way and untrue because uh, China and, and Kenya are partners in so many ways. And uh, China's uh, work in Kenya, especially in the infrastructure and then the technology, they, they are so intertwined in a way that you cannot say whether there was hacking or not, according to the PS in the internal security. So in other ways, he's trying to deny the claims made by Reuters. Uh, but uh, men, uh, men locals are locally are skeptical about the whole statement by the Kenyan government, even the Chinese stuff. I know you've talked a little about the relationship between Kenya and China, but what is the diplomatic or bilateral ties like? It's uh, not not good as it was uh, before. Uh, since uh, Mr. Ruto came to power, uh, the, the, the whole thing has changed. Now, uh, Ruto has uh, shifted his attention to the western part of uh, the world, that's the uh, yeah, US and the EU, as compared to Mr. Uru Kenyatta before. So the relationship is poor, as you can, say, as you can put it. Because uh, as as you can see, even here in Kenya, it has been rare for Mr. Ruto to meet with the Chinese officials or even going to China is not gone as compared to what he has done to the US, the UK and other European nations. So that shows there is a problem. There is a bad relationship between the two nations. For Kenya to make such an accusation in the first place, do you think perhaps they have proof of this cyber attack? Because this is a big accusation. Should they have proof? You can't really prove the whole thing because uh, cyber attacks are, are happening all over the world. You can find that America attacking and even Kenya, European countries are attacking Kenya. So it's not it's not a new phenomenon per se, but proving is a problem again right? because uh, China currently uh, has done a lot in terms of technology. Uh, telco, telco companies in Kenya, uh, the biggest company in Kenya, the Safaricom, uh, is the one uh, is actually lying on highway technology which is supplied by China. So you can't say per se that they are the ones behind the uh, hacking or not. But it's there, I believe it's there. Personally, I know it's there. But the veracity or proving the same is, is a, it's a problem. All right, thank you very much, Cyrus Sombati. Thanks for your time on The World today. Thank you so much. Away from that now, the United Nations Human Rights Chief Volker Turk has described the situation in Sudan as heartbreaking and made a direct call to the two warring generals to stop sexual violence and spare the lives of civilians. Fighting in Sudan that broke out more than a month ago has killed hundreds of civilians and forced more than one million people to flee the violence. Volker Turk, who met with both generals in Sudan in November, said his office had received reports of fighter jets and clashes in the capital, Khartoum overnight, despite a ceasefire. It's heartbreaking what is happening in Sudan. In spite of successive ceasefires, and they keep making these arrangements, we see that they get observed in their preach almost within hours after these arrangements are signed. We see how civilians continue to be exposed to serious risk of death and injury. I mean, overnight we received reports of fighter jets across Khartoum and clashes in some areas of the city as well as gunfire heard Khartoum North and in Om Durman. Very deeply troubling reports of sexual violence in Khartoum and Darfur have emerged. We are aware of at least of 25 cases, but we also know how difficult it is to document these cases, so we are sure that the real number of cases is much higher. General Al-Burhan, General Dagalo, you must issue clear instructions in no uncertain terms 
to all those under your command that there is zero tolerance for sexual violence, that perpetrators of all violations must be held accountable, civilians must be spared, and you must stop this senseless violence now. The United Nations Refugee Agency is racing against time to relocate thousands of refugees in the border areas of Chad to safer areas before the onset of the rainy season as more people continue to flee neighboring Sudan. At the Gangor, one of the several places along the Chad-Sudan border where refugees have been gathering, workers from the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees are already grouping refugees in family units, noting every name, their age and gender, while registering them on the UNHCR records. When we are doing the registration, you know, we take note of family members who are still in, in Sudan, who are not yet in Chad, because as long as they are not in Chad, UNHCR doesn't have any responsibility, you know, because they are not refugees, they are still in the country in Chad. But we take mention of that in case they come, and uh, during the registration of these newcomers, we also ensure that we try to understand exactly where is the family members, uh, or where are the other family members, a mosquito net, a, a blanket, a, a jerry can, a kitchen set, a solar lamp, to ensure that uh, they, you know, they start life afresh in dignity. We deploy in midwives, we make sure that they have dignity kits, but we're making sure that they have emergency reproductive health kits so that we can address uh, their needs. Meanwhile, campaigners are helping in fundraising to evacuate Sudan, South Sudanese nationals trapped amid the ongoing fighting in neighboring Sudan. The campaigners have asked for donations of money, food, tents and clothes to support those who are still trapped in Sudan. The group has hired trucks to carry people from Khartoum. They have also transported hundreds of evacuees back to South Sudan. The people of South Sudan who went to uh, Khartoum uh, during the war of 2013 as refugees, during the war of 2016 as refugees, uh, and those who went for medical attention and also education are all trapped there. We need to target getting 100 trucks to Khartoum, pick up our people, open up some of the road to uh, northern Bargadal, some of the road to Abia, so that our people are evacuated safely. We want to make sure those who come we, we, we actually serve them, we take them where they are going. If it is our people, we take them to their estates or wherever they want to go. If it is a foreign nationals, of course, we will also treat them as refugees and they will have a, a way for them to go because everybody is fleeing from Sudan. Welcome back. Let's give you a breaking story now. A car has crashed into the gates of Downing Streets with no casualties. Not sure if it is still related to terror. Number 10 has been placed on lockdown at the moment after a car attempted to drive into Downing Street. The Metropolitan Police say that armed officers arrested a man on suspicion of criminal damage and dangerous driving after a car collided with the gates there. Staff in Downing Street had been told they could not leave as police officers attempted to secure the scene. Rishi Sunak, the Prime Minister, is understood to have been inside the Allen Street complex when this incident happened. A 10, number 10 source said the driver of the car was a man, but details are still emerging about what exactly took place. But for more on this, our London correspondent, Juliana Olainka, joins me now. Hello, Juliana, and thank you for joining us. What, ne what more do we know apart from what... Uh, we just heard now. Uh, thank you very much, Anne. As you said, this is still very much a developing story. So most of the information that I will be relaying, you have quite um, graciously given to um, the audience. But as we know, at about 4.20 p.m. local time, so just about an hour and a half ago, we know that um, a car has driven into the gates of Downing Street. And just 
in terms of uh, geography here, Downing Street isn't the Palace of Westminster where Prime Minister's questions usually uh, takes place. Uh, Downing Street is just off Whitehall. Uh, for those of our viewers who have visited the Nigeria High Commission in the United Kingdom, it literally is just uh, down the road from there. I've got to say, it's probably one of the most uh, guarded uh, streets in the world. Uh, but alas, uh, this individual managed to plough his car in um, to the gates. I don't know if we have the CCTV. It is doing the rounds on social media, but it did appear to be very, very slow. This is, of course, a huge uh, story in the UK for obvious reasons. Um, I think it does bring back shock and horror, in fact, trauma, because, of course, uh, between kind of like 2015 to 2017, there were a series of terror attacks which actually took place within that location. In fact, there was one um, a terror attack where a, dr a car drove into the gates um, of the Palace of West. Westminster um, and a metropolitan police officer as well as other individuals uh, was stabbed to death. There has also uh, been other um, major issues on London's uh, bridges and uh, this car plow took place just from there. There is a statement, um, Anne, uh, that was released by the Metropolitan Police. Again, uh, this is still a developing story, but the last statement from the Metropolitan Police does read, and around 16, 20 hours, the car collided with the gates of Downing Street on Whitehall. Armed officers arrested a man at the scene on suspicion of criminal damage and dangerous driving. There are no reports of any injuries and inquiries are ongoing. As you quite rightly said, Downing Street and that entire area um, has been uh, blocked off and cordoned off now. It's quite a busy time because anybody that knows London from about 3.30 when schools close to about seven o'clock, this is peak rush hour. So certainly at that time, it would have been incredible busy and because of the location of that area it is frequented uh, by um, lots of tourists um, however just having a look at some of the helicopter aerial views that are being played on British media now it does appear to show that the police are still uh, surveilling uh, the car which does indicate that perhaps they do not believe that it is terror related um, again this is a developing story so we're not sure uh, just yet uh, but a lot of um, experts that have been speaking on the airways are saying this could potentially be mental health. It could potentially be somebody uh, that took a wrong turning. Um, having a look at the CCTV I saw, um, it does appear to show that the car did go into the gates very, very slowly. But this obviously is still incredibly serious. Oh. As somebody has been arrested a male uh, for criminal damage. And we do know that lots of MPs were, of course, in the building uh, because they've been discussing uh, the new immigration rules. All right. Thank you very much, Juliana. I will definitely keep our eyes on that story as um, news or more details come forward. Thank you for your time on The World today. To other stories now, it is Africa Day and South Africa's President Cyril Ramaphosa led the celebration in Johannesburg under the theme deepening the AU's vision of unity, prosperity and modernity for a better Africa and a better world. President Ramaphosa thanks the continent's forebears for having forged an independent free Africa, even though a lot still needs to be done to combat extremism, corruption and conflict. Representatives from different countries showcase their country's unique fashion, art and culture. Africa Day is observed on the 25th of May every year to commemorate Africa's independence, its freedom and liberation from colonialism. Celebrities and fans have paid tribute to Tina Turner, the sole star who has died at the age of 83. Beyonce said she was the epitome of passion and power, while Sir Mac Mick Jagger called her a wonderful friend, an enormously talented performer. Turner was always praised by Maria Carey and Oprah Winfrey as a survivor who overcame years of domestic violence. The Obamas praised her for singing her truth through joy and pain. They were joined by current U.S. President Joe Biden, who noted that 
Tina Turner had started life as a farmer's daughter and hailed her once-in-a-generation talent. The singer's death was announced yesterday by her publicist, but no cause was given. But she had suffered a number of health issues in recent years, including a stroke and kidney disease. Well, you can listen to me on record. <laughs> Simply the best, better than all the rest, better than everyone, anyone I've ever met. Ooh, simply the best. In front of the historic Capitol Records building, fans of Queen of Rock and Roll Tina Turner laid flowers and mementos at her Hollywood Walk of Fame star. Tina Turner began her career back in the 1950s during the early years of rock and roll. For many fans, paying their respect to the late singer, she was a trailblazer who propelled them to pursue their own musical journeys. The influence that Tina Turner has is to, I it mean, it's as an entertainer, I think more than anything, that when it's about when you get on, you get on stage and you perform, because she went through so much in her personal life, and then when you got on stage, you would never know what she's been through, and it just, she, the, the drive in the end, it's all about how she gives her energy out and she and she shares and she has fun on stage. I grew up on soul music just from my parents handing down their, their records to me. So that's what got me into being a DJ. So I'm a record collector, so I had all her music. So, and I listened to her constantly. I loved seeing her performance. I loved seeing her dance. And she was just a, a joyful soul. I think that um, she would be remembered for her big hair and her voice and the things that she had to go through. I mean, most women that have gone through the struggles that she did would want to give up on life. You know what I mean? And maybe do something else or be, you know, beaten down, so-called. So, but with her, it, it raised her up and she was an inspiration to everybody. Well, she definitely will keep living in our hearts. But this is where we draw the cuttings on the world today. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Anne Wawadu.